we'll start off with a talk from, from Jenny Brown about model information its value. Then we'll hear from Judith about uh, regional models for the Caribbean um, in 2D uh, Nemo and Wave Watch 3. And then we'll hear from Valerie and Marta about 3D Nemo, current stratification and sea surface temperature. So I'll just stop sharing and pass over to Jenny now. Hey everyone, I will just get my slides up on screen for you. So hopefully you've now got all of my uh, slides nicely shown on the screen. So I'm going to kick off with a, an introductory presentation and then I will be followed uh, with two more talks after me, looking at a little bit more detail of some of the modelling work that we've been doing within this uh, project. So I'm going to start off trying to get everyone thinking about why we use models. Well, I am a modeler I'm, and they're often used to be used to forecast conditions that are going to impact us in the near future and to project long term changes. So some of my photos here are showing um, changes in sand dunes, where will the edge of the sand dunes be in the future, uh, but also I've got a port there, um, how shipping will change in the future, how wave conditions will change, what will the weather windows be like. Models can provide evidence for coastal planners, managers and policy makers so they can make the decisions so they can plan for this future change. Model data can also provide us uh, with scenarios so we can test the impact of human intervention before we actually start to implement new coastal schemes or develop a new port or harbour. Models also provide early warning and hazards to alert us to conditions that could impact us and they can explore interactions so we understand what's happening at our coast so we can better work with nature. And this, they also allow us to target where to collect observations. Um, so a model provides us with a big picture of an area and we can identify where there's complexity so we need to find more information about. So I'm gonna do a very quick poll to start off with. Um, and that the poll is going to actually find out what type of models you're using in your work. So if you hang on a minute, the poll should be loading on your screens now. If you all, there's two questions on there. I'd be interested to find out, do you use modeling in your work? And if you do, what type of models do you use? What types of models are there for ocean applications? Well, this is a nice photo taken um, from St Vincent and the Grenadines. And there's models that can really replicate everything and try and get a full system understanding. These are the types of processes we typically model. It might be the tides and surge to understand where water levels are. It might be the waves and understanding the run-up of waves might be sediment transport, it could be particle tracking linking to sargassum or oil spills, it might be shoreline evolution if you're thinking about where to plan community development, it might be storm impact if you're uh, trying to build a resilience plan against flooding and erosion, it might be to understand changing ecosystems or water quality, and it's also, you can also model many other processes. Models often run at different timescales in time and both space. They cover different domains and also different periods. And this makes it very important to choose the right model for the question that you're trying to ask and the, trying to identify the answers you require. So it looks like most people are interested in coastal evolution, flood inundation and beach erosion. So, Models are often used to understand interactions between different processes and to collect evidence to understand how these processes are interacting. So we often have processes that include sea levels, sea level change, winds, waves, cyclones, temperature change, ocean acidification and salinity. 
By modeling these processes, we start to understand the physical impacts, which are flooding and erosion, but also the impacts on ecosystems, that's corals, mangroves, and seagrasses. We can then use, also use models to understand the interactions between ecosystems and physical processes. And then that helps us plan different, um, plan for fisheries, plan for communities, and, and plan future design for island-wide uh, coastal management. So hopefully we're gonna do okay with this word cloud. I'm actually interested in what type of models do you use? So if you go to menti.com and then use the code 53655899, I'll put that in the chat in a minute. Hopefully we can develop a word cloud that looks at the models that you use. And the types of words I'm interested in are the models that the names of the models that you use so it might be Nemo or POM or FBCOM um, and also the types of models so if it's sediment transport or wave models or inundation models and we'll see if there's something that clearly stands out or a clear set of models that you will use so I'm going to stop sharing uh, my slides for a minute uh, and just change to the web page so we can have a live view of that word cloud as it generates it looks like HICOM is one of the most popular models, followed by NEMO. If people want to continue adding to that, uh, that word cloud will continue to be made and we can uh, look at it again in the break. I shall just uh, stop sharing this screen now and go back to the other one. Okay, so using models and when we've got information about the waves and the water levels, we can start to explore um, the hazards and the vulnerability. So this is work that has been published from this project, looking at the coastal vulnerability and the exposure of shorelines to changing conditions. So this map shows um, an exposure index and three, it's got a traffic light system where three is green going up to five, which is red and hazardous. So the conditions look at no exposure to physical change, moderate exposure, and if they're fully exposed. And they look at, and you, we include things like waves, water levels, wind, and the present day rates of sea level rise. So from this, we can look at different parts of the Caribbean and compare their exposure uh, to other locations. So we can see that St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which was our focus during this study, has a moderately high exposure to ocean hazards related to the other islands within the Caribbean. And that's seen because it's got quite a yellowy orange shading. So to build a hazard exposure map like that, we need to understand the sea level projections, which can come from model results. So these are the, part, the present and the future sea level projections around the shorelines of the Caribbean looking at the rates for present day, so that's between 2010 and 2020, looking at the raise in millimetres per year, and then also looking at the future rise, which is 2090 to 2100. And we can see that the present day rates have increased into the future because the colour bars have become much larger. We can also use models to look at climate scenarios, the changing wave conditions, so this plot is showing the difference in the projected 30 year mean annual wave maxima um, compared to historic conditions. So again, we can see that the yellow shading is indicating that the mean annual maxima in wave conditions is increasing into the future. So the models are giving us a nice um, potential of what we need to plan for. A lot of people were interested in coastal hazards, uh, one of which is flood impact. So flooding is related to the sea level, also the surge levels that increase the mean water level, the wind waves and the swell waves that occur on top of this water level, and how the mean changes in time due to sea level rise. And then models can take those predictions and predict how the overtopping might change in response to these changing conditions. Coastal erosion is another hazard which many people are interested in and the driving processes of the waves, the sea level, the wind, but also the sediment supply and how intervention by humans can change that sediment supply. And the impacts of coastal erosion linked to land loss, habitat loss, 
destruction of coastal infrastructure and displacement, and that can be of people and also of wildlife. So it's not only sediments that move around due to uh, the coastal conditions, um, but it can also be any types of particles. Um, and on these slides, I have got a particle tracking model, which will be, which will be talked about uh, a different one in more detail in some of the other presentations. But these animations just show how sediments can move under different conditions. So in the movie that's running now, we can see sediments going backwards and forwards in response to the tide. However, in this second model, we have tides, but we also include river flow and there's a freshwater influence. In the second movie on the right top right of the screen, we can see that the particles are moving to the south. And that's because in addition to the tidal move going uh, to the, between the left and right, there's also a gravitational circulation due, due to the flow of the rivers. So particle tracking models can be used to look at contaminants and pollutants, the sediments as they are in the examples that I'm showing. They can be used to perhaps track sargassum, fish eggs, and many other different processes that we're interested in. So if you've got a particle tracking model, you can program the behaviors of the particles uh, to track the properties that you're interested in. Models can also be used to look at um, habitats and change. So this again is just some example model runs looking at future change. The horizontal lines represent the near bed temperature and the sea surface temperature uh, if current conditions continued. But the more spiky lines that are projecting what happens in the future due to different um, concentration pathways show that how the temperature of the sea changes in time at different parts of the water column. So if you're interested in habitats, you might be interested in the, the um, near bed temperatures, or if you're interested in something that uh, is floating near the surface, you might be interested in the surf changes in surface temperatures. Also look at salinity and the change also at the surface and the near bed or at any point within the water column. And by understanding the changes in the water column properties, we get a better understanding of how habitats might respond in the future and change. Very often uh, models are used to explain conditions, uh, and multi hazards and the processes that interact with each other. So this example is obviously linked to flood hazards. Models can be used to understand the source processes that create the hazard and how they interact. They can be used to understand the pathways of these hazards. So in this case, it's how the water propagates through or over a defense. And they can also be used to understand what the consequence is. So you could look at an inundation model that would simulate how the receptor in this, this instance, the community or the industry is impacted by the water that's causing inundation. Very often uh, a model can explore many different combinations of events and then you, they can be put together into a decision support tool. So this plot's just showing a, a mapped example that has been used in the UK to support coastal managers. The traffic light system is looking at the debris factor which is related to the land use, the velocity of the water and the depth of the water and then we've got a traffic light system to be able to give warnings to people working in this area so they know how to plan the land use perhaps where schools would go where where properties go and then on the left you'll see there's some slider options so the slider bars allow you to scroll and change the maps between different sea level scenarios but also different storm severities so by running multiple models you can create a matrix of information that can then be interrogated through web interfaces uh, to explore explore these systems in kind of a lookup style approach so it's much more efficient than running a model in real time to look at the management decisions. How are, how are models actually used for planning and for hazard forecasting and projecting change? So this example is a, a coastal seawall that we have on the screen uh, and there's obviously lots of ways a model can be used to plan a seawall, whether it's in the design or whether it's to monitor changing um, conditions or whether it's to give an alert when a, a, a defence inspection or maintenance is required. 
So models can be run in many different ways. They might be deterministic, a single simulation. They might be run in, or some, in ensembles, which means many different uh, model scenarios are run. They might be slightly different models, or they might have slightly different parameter settings with them to create a range of plausible outcomes. Models can be run in hindcast mode to understand past events, or they can be run in forecast mode to look at the present and future conditions. They can be used to create long-term or large-scale data sets, and then these data sets can be used for statistical analysis to look at the local or even island-wide impacts. We also have things like data-driven modeling, uh, which is often behavioral and uses observations, or we can have empirical rules um, that are process-based. Machine learning is now coming, becoming a common approach to also uh, represent the processes that are happening. And then conceptual modeling is another approach that can be used by planners by creating a diagram of processes to try and represent what's happening in an area. Okay, so I'm going to just run another poll to try and understand a little bit more information about the models that you have been using. Again, so it looks like WaveWatch 3, HiCom, and, oh, and other models are being used. So hopefully people who use other models have put the names of those models within the word cloud so we can view that later and see what it looks like. Okay, so if you're using a model, it's very important to understand what the limitations might be. And these limitations might be the computer power, the computational time, the resolution of the grid, or even the shape of the grid, whether it's squares or triangles. Does it resolve the coastline or does it create a stepped coastline? You also need to understand where parameterizations have been applied for unresolved processes and where information um, is available to either set up boundary conditions or provide the forcing. You also need to understand the uncertainty and be able to validate or calibrate models. So some observations are often needed alongside a modeling application. So what value do models add alongside observations? Why don't you do one in isolation? Well, models can expand the information that we observe in time and space uh, because they cover a much larger area very efficiently without the need for boats or equipment to be deployed. You can nest a model from a global scale to the local site of interest. Models can look at future impacts and change, which obviously we can't observe, but they can also reanalyze the past and we can identify tipping points within a system. By making very small incremental changes within a model, we can understand which conditions trigger large changes. If we only observe, observe a system for a couple of weeks and then go away and then come back, we might miss those incremental changes. And they can also cover areas that are inaccessible. So some coastal conditions are quite tricky to get to by boat, whereas a model, if you can set up the grid and you've got the bathymetry or a good understanding of the bathymetry, you can set up a representation of that area. Why do they go together in decision making? Well, you can use models uh, to predict and visualize what might happen if you're planning something. You need the observations to validate and calibrate that model. And, and sometimes you need it as the forcing condition to drive that model. Once you've then got the model running and you're happy and confident in the results, you can then use the model results to visualize the what if scenarios and you can then interpret in interrogate and inter interpret these results to try and inform policy and decision making okay so let's have another little poll to try and understand um what type of where when you run your own models and when you ask others to run them on your behalf This is a very quick question. So it's, do you use models or do you often contract others to carry out modeling for you? Yeah. 
So it looks like most people in the audience use their own models. Oh, now it's gone the other way. Okay, so it looks like about, about a 50-50 split, I would say, people using their own models and using other people to simulate model results for them. And then I'm also going to ask the question, uh, do you think you would use models in the future? So I guess many people are using them and the people who aren't using them, do you think you would like to use them? Well, that was a very easy poll. Everyone said yes. So that's a, a good answer. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to say we should take a break there um, because every, every I'm now going to just go through some of the example modelling applications that have been used in some of our work in St Vincent and the Grenadines, just to give you an idea of what we've done uh, before the next presentations today and over the next couple of days go into some of the more detailed and more recent work. So the modelling studies that we've been doing have used NEMO, um, which is the Nucleus for European Modelling of the Ocean, uh, simulates tides and surge, and also WaveWatch 3, which is a spectral wave model, which represents the sea state. So the models have been set up uh, at a global scale to provide boundary conditions uh, to the regional Caribbean models that we've been using. Model domain is shown on the left-hand side of your screens. It's a two, they're two-dimensional models and they've been set up in 12 kilometer resolution. The models have simulated sea surface heights and currents using NEMO and also the wave heights and wave period using WaveWatch 3. The input requirements were the bathymetry, uh, tidal information around the edges, wave information at the edges, but also the atmospheric pressure and wind forcing on the surface of the models. These forcing data have come from era five and also idealized model scenarios. And the outputs have been the sea surface height, the currents, the significant wave height, tidal harmonics, and all the data has been provided in NetCDF file formats. Once a model has been set up, it's very important to check it against observations. So tide gauge data has been used in St Vincent uh, to ensure that the water levels look sensible by comparing the model simulation with the observations over a certain period of time. The same has been done for the wave model using wave buoys that are available through the Caribbean region. And uh, the wave heights have been compared to the observations over a set period of time. So then the results I'm just going to show on the next few slides are looking at Hurricane Ivan. So that's a Category 5 hurricane event and it happened in September 2004 and it had quite an impact on the local area, which you're all aware of. So these are the model simulations. On the left hand side of the screen, we've got the residual surge. We can see the storm carrying along at the track, which is the dashed lines. And on the right hand side, we have the wind fields from the era five forcing. We can see that as the storm propagates along its track, the largest surge is basically directly underneath the storm. We can also use the models to zoom in in certain areas. So here we're looking at St Vincent and the Grenadines, and you've got a clearer picture of how the storm passed by this network of islands. And again, you can still see that the surge is largest directly underneath the storm track. So looking at St Vincent, a number of time series were extracted at seven points around the island. And all of these points show a similar peak in the surge conditions between 10 to 14 centimetres. So we can get an idea of the actual measure of the surge around the whole of the island to assess its impact. Then model the waves. And again, we've got the storm winds on the right and the wave heights on the left. 
here that we can see the maximum waves don't actually propagate underneath the storm track, but they're to the right hand side, or in this case, above the storm track. Even though Ivan was not directly impacting St Vincent, the waves could reach six metres at the western side of the island. So if we plot the maximum conditions that occurred throughout this period, we've got the waves and we've also got the surge. And we can clearly see that the surge was strongest under the track and that the waves are higher to the north of the track, impacting the western edge of the islands. So the locations that where there might have been hazardous surge differ to those where there could have been hazardous wave impacts. The summary of those findings were that the surge around the islands was between 15 to 25 centimetres, depending where the islands were positioned relative to the track. The wave heights could reach up to about six metres on the west coasts of the islands. The waves appear to oppose a greater risk during the case study and are more persistent. The surge can still be significant for low-lying areas close to the coast, and the surge is, has the largest is largest when there's a direct impact by a hurricane. The waves can pose a large risk even when storms pass from afar and surge affects the entire coastline. Waves are more of a hazard to the west and north during this storm, storm condition. So using the Nemo and Wave Watch 3 models, we now have boundary conditions to look at storm impacts actually on the beach. And this first example is looking at erosion models. So here we've used a model called X Beach, which looks at storm erosion in response to different wave and water level conditions. A number of different combinations of wave heights and wave periods and extreme water levels were simulated, which are shown in the table. These conditions represent those measured by an AWAC that was recently deployed in this location but also the conditions predicted by Nemo and WaveWatch 3 using different atmospheric forcing, whether that was Era 5 or Holland winds, which represent uh, the storm itself more accurately, or uh, an enhanced wind scenario, which represents a Category 5 storm event. This just shows how the beach levels can change across a profile from these scenario simulations. So most of the beach profiles erode in the upper half, upper 150 metres of the beach. More extreme events can actually impact the profile to, to over 250 metres of the beach profile. So this starts to give you an understanding if you're planning kind of new infrastructure which portions of the beach profile will be impacted by storms. And using the different boundary condition, it highlights the potential severity of a category four hurricane. We can also look at wave runup, not only the morphology. So wave runup corresponds to an elevation, a, the water level elevation that the waves reach 98% of the time in the swash zone. And this is controlled by both the wave conditions and the beach slope. So the R2% parameter is what we use to measure runup. This is the elevation that is only exceeded by 2% of the waves during the simulated storm event. So from all the different scenarios that we've simulated, there is quite a variability in the R2% values. And this is linked to either the event severity but also the, best, the improved resolution of the hurricane. It's not only kind of beach erosion that we look at, but if we know how the beach evolves under a storm and also what the run-up levels look like, we can then start to explore flood inundation. So this inundation simulation is looking at the new airport in St Vincent. So where the airport is, the River Yambu flows under the runway, and this makes it vulnerable to both coastal and fluvial flooding. Storm surges and flush floods can influence the runway area, and also boulder-sized sediment um, can also lead to blockages of tunnels that, flow, that allow flow to drain and clear under the runway. 
So simulations have been run using an inundation model called list flood, which has been forced by the X beach model to impose coastal conditions. So under the runway, there are a number of tunnels uh, that allow the river to flow under it, but also allow uh, any flood water to drain off the runway. By simulating Hurricane Ivan, uh, the waves and surge levels have also been superimposed with sea level rise of present day, so nothing, zero metres, and future sea level levels representing 1.1 metre and 5.48 metres. They've also, each simulation has been run with different rainfall events and different hydrographs, representing a one in five year rainfall event and a one in 50 year event. And the model can also be used to explore how tunnel restrictions from 20% to 100% blockages impact the flood risk. This can then be used to identify the flood inundation over the runway to understand how future events could pose a hazard. So from these simulations, um, it's found that the northern runway is where the safety case is required. And it, this is, at this end, there is a large amount of land that provides a safety barrier. The runway isn't uh, fully inundated and no inundation occurs until over 80% of the tunnels become blocked under present sea levels and also sea levels in 2100. But if we think about the more extreme sea levels exceeding five metres, which represent 2,500, then there is a lot more um, inundation that occurs without the tunnels being constricted. So from these results, we find that the drainage still performs well to limit the extent of inundation on the runway. However, the runway width itself has been reduced. We can also explore the hazard to the road access around the runway. So these model simulations aren't perfect, they aren't reality, they are a good representation of the processes that are occurring. So they don't include vegetation and other factors that might divert some of the flood water. So under the extreme flood hazard rating, the following lengths of road could be inundated using the scenarios we've presented. So for present day sea level, up to 410 metres of the road can be flooded to a hazardous extent. Using the 2100 sea level conditions, this can increase to over a thousand metres. And in 2500, this can increase to over 1500 metres. So it enables people to plan um, new access routes or modify access routes to ensure there aren't hazardous conditions that are going to pose a threat to the runway op operations in the future. So that is um, all of my slides. If people have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them uh, before we move on to the next speaker.